what a day. Fifteen deliveries and one to go. <laughs> Everybody's glad to see the stork. <laughs> Here, stork, have a drink to the new baby. Oh, have another. Come on, bottoms up. One for the road. You're gonna be social. You're gonna be social. You just can't refuse the generous hospital. The hospital. You just can't refuse them. Well, I better be going. That mother gorilla must be getting worried. Gone? Oh, no. I'll be dismissed. Kicked out of the store club. I've just got to get a baby somehow. I dream of teeny she's a light brown hair. La da da dee da 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 I dream of Jeannie, she's a light brown Congrats, congrats, congratulations, you're a mother. Elvis, look, it's arrived, our baby is here. <laughs> our baby no matter what he looks like he's still your son so how many of you grew up on cartoons like that yeah <laughs> well I enjoy them I still enjoy them <laughs> you gotta have cartoons to start don't you that's what I'd say I think so yeah <laughs> I'll tell you what so who's your favorite uh, character Bugs Bunny uh, yeah no who's your favorite character Marvin Did I hear Marvin's I want to heard yeah what, Marvin's yours? The Roadrunner? Road okay. <laughs> Everybody's got their favorite. Wiley Coyote? Yeah, that's that. He's a good one, too. Yeah. The Taz? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you have seen that new commercial with the Tasmanian Devil? You don't give a... Yeah, you don't give, uh, what, energy drinks to some cartoon characters? Yeah, it goes crazy. That's pretty hilarious, I'll tell you. Let me just welcome you to GraceLife.tv today. Really glad to have you with us. As well as those of you viewing us online, we've got people viewing us online all over the United States and around the world, quite literally. And listen, you are a very integral part of GraceLife.tv here at the El Paso campus. Um, so, I, so I hope you all are having a Merry Christmas so far. How's your Christmas going so far? Good? Uh, or maybe a happy holidays, huh? Have you been hearing the happy holidays uh, greeting around here and there? Uh, don't you don't hang around those people. <laughs> yeah, if you want to create controversy, that's the way to get the controversy started, isn't it? But you know, there is controversy when there's uh, when you start talking about Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or those kind of things because you know what? I've been seeing a lot of stuff on Facebook, or at least a, a, a little bit of stuff on Facebook about you know. Uh, not using the the happy holidays, happy holidays greetings, but be sure and keep Christ in Christmas and all those different kind of things, you know, and all that stuff that's kind of going around. But there is kind of a tension that surrounds Christmas when it comes to those kind of things because, you know, well, I think it's because uh, whenever we talk about God becoming one of us, then we've got a problem. You know, there's going to be problems in our world today. Whenever you talk about God coming to this earth and becoming a human being, then you got trouble. There's going to be some controversy. There's going to be some tension that's there. On the other hand, have you noticed how perfectly acceptable it is in our world today to talk about God? Uh, I mean, that, that seems to be a really popular subject these days. Uh, even the TV programs are showing that, aren't they? They're doing, you know, like the Rev new Revelation series or whatever it's coming out. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, programs about God, you know. You can talk about God almost anywhere you want to as long as you use the word God. But if you ever start using the word, the name Jesus, then you got problems. Then you, then there's going to be some trouble, because then you're talking about somebody specific. As long as you talk about God, which is kind of a generic thing, that could be any God, any any uh, any person or or a non-God, whatever it is you, you want to talk about. And everybody has their own ideas about who God is. So as long as you just say God, everything is cool, you know. And there seems to be a lot of interest in, in just talking about God and spiritual things these days. Um, <clears throat> well, the generic term God uh, can, as I said a moment ago, can literally mean anything you want it to mean, and which makes it really easy to use the word 
the term God in our world today. But as soon as you mention the name of Jesus, then there's going to be a fight. Um, when, I was first, when I first moved here to El Paso, which has been uh, uh, 14 years ago now, it doesn't seem like that long. In other ways, it seems like a lifetime. <laughs> no, I've, I've enjoyed being here. It's been good being here at, at gracelife.tv. But you know what? Uh, the very first year that I was here, uh, they called me from the city count, from the city offices. I mean, they, they found out I was new in the area. And man, they were anxious. The secretary was, you could hear the anxiousness in her voice. She wanted me to come down and do the prayer down there at the city council meetings, you know. And she said, she told me directly, she said, we have a really, really hard time finding a pastor who will come down to the city office or sit down and do the prayer at the city council meeting. I said, hey, no problem, you know. And I kept thinking, well, what's the problem? Why, why, would there, why would there have a hard time finding pastors to go do that, you know? Because, uh, you know, you just drive downtown and, you know, it takes a little time out of your schedule, but no big deal, I thought. And uh, she said, well, I'll be, or she said, great, you know, she was all excited, great, wonderful. I'll send you this piece of paper, this little instruction sheet. It'll tell you what you need to do, how to get here, that kind of stuff. Of course, being new to, to the area, and I've never lived in a city before, and uh, especially one this size. And, and so I was thinking, well, great, great. She's going to give me some directions on how to get there. That was, that was my biggest worry. How do I get downtown, you know, to the city offices? Well, I never got the letter. I, I guess she never sent it. That's the only thing I can assume. I don't know. I never got the letter, but when, the, when, the, when the, that particular day came that I was supposed to be down there, she said, this is the time you need to be there, not cool. So I, I asked directions from several people, you know, in the church and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was really nervous about getting down there, going downtown and all that kind of stuff. I remember, you know, even going down to the hospital was a big deal because uh, it was just like, man, I, I, wow, it was, it was crazy. You know, all this traffic and people and stuff everywhere. So I got down there and uh, to the city office and I found the right place to go and finally found somebody who knew that I was supposed to be there and they took me into the room where, where they had the city council meeting and I sat there for a little while until they decided to get started and then they called on me and so I stood up and I prayed, you know, just like I always, always do and no problem and I, of course, I ended my prayer in Jesus' name like I always, like I almost always do uh, and and they, I got frowns for some reason. I couldn't figure out why. Uh, and they, and to this day, 14 years, they have never even close to invited me back again. And I wondered about that for a while, but then I began to realize, and, and I think, I, maybe I think I actually talked to the secretary afterwards, and she said, well, you weren't supposed to use the name Jesus, right? Oh, so that's the problem. <laughs> You know, I said, didn't you get the instruction sheet we sent you? I said, no, ma'am, I sure didn't. I don't know what happened to it, but I didn't get it. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to do that. That didn't mean I wouldn't have anyway, but uh, anyway, I wasn't supposed to do that. So long story short, like I said, they have, you know, it caused a lot of controversy in the, in the city council meeting, and they have never invited me to give it back since that day. Uh, so I, again, I'm going to tell you that you can use the name God anytime and anywhere you want to. You can pray in God's name, or you can a lot of, use a lot of other terms. Matter of fact, on this this uh, picture right here, you can use almost any of the other words that are listed there, uh, except for the name of Jesus. You can use almost any other term. You know, uh, the the Great Shepherd or the Good Shepherd. You hear that sometimes instead of using the name of Jesus or those kind of things, and that's okay. Uh, but to use the name of Jesus is one of those things that you just ain't supposed to do. Uh, but that really isn't anything anything new. You realize that? Do you know that? It's not anything new. It's been around for many, many centuries, as a matter of fact. Because this same controversy has been going on for thousands, literally thousands of years. So let me take you back to the very beginning of this controversy, which I think is the beginning of the controversy. Way back in the Old Testament, during the reign of King Ahab, there was a prophecy sent from God through the prophet Isaiah, a message that was designed to bring hope and comfort, of course, to, to a group of people that really needed a break in those, you know, unsettled, horrible times in which they were living back then. So what you need to know is that that prophecy was written 740 years before 
the birth of Jesus Christ. 740 years before Jesus was born, that prophecy was given. That means that even though it's now been 2,754 years since then, uh, this exact same controversy is as much alive and well today as it was way back then. It caused a lot of controversy back then, and it still does. 1700 and, or 2,754 years later, we still have this same controversy going on. So here's what caused the controversy. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So who can tell me what Emmanuel means? God with us. Yes. So there's the controversy. See, there's where it all got started. As soon as God said that His name will be God with us, that literally God is living among men, that God will be born among men and live among us, uh, we've got problems. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Try to imagine how... Uh, enormous and relentless this controversy has been for so many centuries approximately 2748 or 54 years whatever it is after the birth of Jesus Christ was first prophesied and and the controversy is alive and well today as it was way back then I mean it's still a problem nobody's gotten over it from day one as a matter of fact if anything there's even more tension and more controversy today than maybe almost any other time in history and I think more than any other prophecy within the Bible. I, I think that's why this new series about Revelation, you know, uh, is coming up is that you can even talk about that kind of stuff. That's, co that's cool. That's not a problem, right? You can talk about all that kind of stuff. Anything about the Bible. Matter of fact, there's all kinds of stuff. I watched a program uh, earlier this week uh, about uh, Noah and the, and the ark. Of course, they're always trying to discount it and all those kind of things. And and it was you know there been a, there were several hours worth of that kind of stuff there. But you can talk about that stuff. That's okay. You know, as long as we're talking about God, you know, uh, you can talk about God all you want to. God did this or God didn't do that. That there was there really a great flood or was there not? Did God actually tell Noah to build this ark? And was the ark as big as it was supposed to be? And if it was, then there's no way that they could have built one that big way back then. And all that kind of stuff. They can go into lots and lots and lots of detail about God and about what God does or what they think God supposedly may have done. All those different kind of things. But, you know, Jesus is one of those names that you just don't talk about in a public setting. You're just not supposed to do that. So this particular prophecy has been a real difficulty for centuries, uh, millennia. Okay, so as many, many of you probably already know, I worked uh, in my early career, and I thought that's what I was going to be doing the rest of my life. I started out working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, I worked on the big ranches in northern New Mexico, and did a lot of work up in those areas for 10 years. And the, and the first 10 years, those, those first 10 years, I had the opportunity to become intimately acquainted with a lot of coyotes. Um, you know, I mean, uh, and I tell you what, I have, I have the utmost, I learned to have the utmost respect for the American coyote. I really do. Uh, that is the most amazing animal on the face of this earth, if you ask me. Uh, I've been around them a lot. I spent 10 years around them. Uh, I studied them. I did all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's an amazing animal. Uh, they can live when nothing else can. They will live off of anything. It doesn't matter. If you've got chickens in your backyard, they'll eat, you'll eat your chickens. If you don't have that, if you've got a little dog, they'll eat your dog. If you don't have a cat, they'll eat your cat. If they don't, you don't have any, they'll eat the dog food. It doesn't matter. Uh, they found uh, in the studies that they uh, that did back then, they, they found that coyote, they found all kinds of things in the, in the stomach of coyote, including rubber tires, you know, pieces of rubber, <laughs> of course, leather, those kind of things. Uh, they'll live on grasshoppers, nothing but grasshoppers, that's all available. They'll live on grass, if that's all of it, that's available. Go out in the desert sometime right here and you'll see that they live on mesquite beans. 
at certain times of the year. Or I'm, I know they have problems with them up there in the, um, uh, uh, the orchards north of here. The pecan orchards. Couldn't think of the name. Up in the, they eat pecans. Doesn't matter. Whatever is available, they'll eat it. Matter of fact, there's a saying among the guys I used to work with, and I, I guess it's still around, is that when the last coyote on earth, or last man on earth dies, there will be a coyote there to lick his bones. <laughs> you know, they're that resourceful. They really are. They really are. Um, so during those years, I also had uh, opportunity to, make, uh, to, to see a lot of coyote puppies. Talk about cute little things. Uh, they're really something. And I vividly remember the first time I found a den full of cute little puppies, and I tried to coax them out. I sat beside the den, and I, I tried to coax them out, and I talked to them, and I, you know, come on, you know, and you know, you do you, all that kind of stuff. And I, I tell you what, it didn't matter what I did, they were going to have none of me. They didn't want anything to do with me at all. Uh, the only way you could ever actually see them is if you'd sit really, really quiet by the entrance of the den and they'd sit there for a long time, and they might finally venture out a little bit and those kind of things. But you know, no matter, no matter what I did, they were always scared to death of me. Well, obviously. You know, I tried to convince them I was a good guy. I tried to convince them that, you know, I just wanted to help them. I, and the harder I tried to convince them how hard that, that I was going to try to help them, uh, the, the more scared they seemed to me of me. Yet be of me. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that's just the way it was. They were always afraid of me no matter what. Well, check these out. Here's a couple of pictures of, uh, there's a coyote puppy right there in, in the den of my house uh, where, we, where I lived. And uh, isn't she cute? I mean, the puppy's okay too, but the little girl's really, that's my daughter <laughs> when she was real little. I don't know what she's been eating, but her face is all dirty with something. Looks like carrots or something. I don't know what she's been eating. But coyote puppers are the cutest little things you'll ever want to come across. And, um, you know, I, I tried to, to make out like I was some kind of a coyote dog uh, god, you know, to say, hey, I'm going to save you. You know, I'll, I'll be good to you. I'll take you home. I'll feed you. You can live in a nice warm house. You can do all these kind of things. But you know what? If they would just trust me, I could have done that. I would have done that. And, and I tried that, you know, with several puppies. I brought them home and those kind of things. But you know, no matter how hard I tried to convince them, they still didn't want anything to do with me. Well, why is that? Well, because... Uh, I was so, so completely foreign to, to their world, so totally foreign to anything that they knew or understood or, or lived like or any of those kind of things that, uh, that I was just uh, way out there, like an alien of some kind, you know? You know what I mean? Um, as a matter of fact, if you stop and think about it, the only way that, that they could have been able to understand was if I could have become one of them. Uh, that's the only way they would have understood me, is if I could have become one of them. So the reason I tell you that story is because that's exactly what God did for us, is that He became one of us. There's no way that we could understand God, and we are a, our, our world is afraid of God because they don't understand Him. They don't know who He is. And, and no matter how much he tries to show us his love and mercy, all through the Old Testament where we read, where he tried to show them how his, his love and his mercy and his care for them all the way through, uh, not only did God give Adam and Eve a beautiful garden to live in, uh, but he told them if anything they, they, they could eat of anything that they wanted to except for that one tree, you know? And then even after they did sin by eating of that forbidden fruit, of that one tree that they're not supposed to eat from, you know, God blessed them again with other things. He continually blessed them, even though they were always doing things against Him. So He blessed them again with other things, and they rebelled some more. And you know what? God let them suffer the consequences of their decision, just like God does with us. He lets us suffer the consequences of our decision, the earthly consequences. But all of this was an effort to let us know, to help us to know, to, to cause us to know that He's there, that He cares for us, that He loves us. And if we would simply trust Him, we would find life to be much easier than we ever dreamed possible. So God tries everything, tried everything that He possibly could to get man to understand how much He wanted to make their life better. I tried to get those puppies to understand, I can make your life better, you know. I can give you a good life. 
You can get fresh water every day. You can get nice, clean food every day. But they didn't understand that until finally one day, God said, you know, there's only one possible answer. And that's if I become one of them. If I can show them physically who I am in a physical way, that way they'll understand. I will become one of them. So let's, take, let's go back for a second. If I were to take, uh, to convince those coyote puppies that I was there to save them uh, by, you know, being born as a coyote puppy in a nice warm house somewhere, right? Being born as a coyote puppy in a nice warm house where everything's cool, it's all wonderful, you know, got good food, nice bed to sleep in, it, that, that wouldn't help me relate to them, would it? Because they're born in the wild, not in a nice warm house. They're born in, a, in the wild. They're not born in a, in a house with, you know, somebody to take care of them all the time and to feed them and make sure they're warm and all those different kind of things. Um, because, you know, that's all they would know. So the only way you can really do that then is to be born where they're born, right? Which would be deep inside of a hole in as far from civilization as you can possibly get. And I think that's why God decided to be born in a barn. Not in a mansion somewhere, not in a nice warm house, not where everything was good and clean and wonderful and perfect, but be born, you know, where we live, <laughs> right? Where a lot of us live. And then he was raised in the despised town of Nazareth. As a matter of fact, from what I can find out, the name Nazarene actually means despised one. You read in the Bible where Jesus was despised because he was called a Nazarene. You know, they, well, isn't this, this, isn't this a Nazarene? You know, well, we, we already know he ain't no good, you know. So, so why a virgin birth? Well, because to be born totally human without also being totally God would make Jesus no different than uh, Muhammad or Buddha or Hare Krishna or... Joseph Smith or Dave Ratzliff for that matter, right? Wouldn't make him any different if he was born totally human. But he was born as much human as he was God, or much God as he is human. But the Bible tells us that he wasn't born of a human seed, human father, the seed of a human father, but a seed of the Holy Spirit. Check this out. It says in Matthew 1.20, But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and they're talking about Joseph here, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now there's a whole other subject there about, you know, the controversy that uh, Mary and Joseph had to endure for being, uh, you know, an unwed parents and all those different kind of things, you know. There's a, boy, I'll tell you what, there's a subject. Uh, that's, that's quite a controversy there as well. But you know, it, when, when God told, when the angel of the Lord told Joseph that it was of, a, of a, the seed of the Holy Spirit that she was pregnant, then that changed things for him. Do you know what? Um, Jesus literally is God in human flesh. Uh, through the union of the Spirit with the physical, God became totally human and yet still totally God. Do I understand that? No, I don't. Can I explain that? No, I can't. How, how Jesus can be totally human and yet totally God, I don't understand that. But that doesn't change the facts. But the thought that God could become and would become and did become one of us creates a rather severe brain overload <laughs> because it's far beyond our human comprehension to... Uh, even understand that possibility. It seems like a total impossibility. So when Jesus, let's jump ahead though, then. So when Jesus uh, uh, exited this earth, when he left this earth after his death and resurrection, does that mean he no longer is Emmanuel, God with us? I mean, while Jesus was walking on this earth, we could say, yeah, he was Emmanuel, he was God with us. But after he left, does that mean he is no longer God with us? Well, no, because Jesus said in John 14, verses 19 and 20, He said, After a little while, the world will no longer see Me, but you will see Me because I live. 
you will live awful also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So what he's telling us here is that he is sending his Holy Spirit to come and to live within us, that he is here. It's not like he's gone away and gone forever. Uh, he, he is here. In a very real sense, he's here. So, okay, to, to kind of help us understand this or relate to this maybe a little better, what I want you to do, do right now is I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you look, a lot, you look just like Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look just like Jesus. Ah, good. Cool. Okay, now turn to your other neighbor and say, well, you look just like Jesus too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess that's what Jesus looks like. Could be. I, you know, I'll tell you. Well, actually, you know, when you do look at a fellow believer in Jesus Christ, they do look like Jesus. That's what Jesus looks like. We can see Jesus in others, and that's what's important is that we do see Jesus in others. That, that, our, that, that the people we come in contact with, every believer, born-again believer in Jesus Christ, has the life of Christ within them. Now, if you have the life of Christ within you, then that means that you look like Jesus. Uh, maybe not physically, in that sense of the word, specifically, but you look like Jesus. Definitely do. Uh, so you can look at any person who knows Jesus and you can say, listen, that, that's Jesus in human clothing. I don't care what they look like. That's, that, they look like Jesus. That's the way that is. So let me ask you this question. Did Jesus look like you thought he would? <laughs> when you turned to your neighbor and said you look like Jesus, did, did they look like you thought Jesus would look like? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but you know what he does. That's what he looks like. You know, to... To maybe some of us, he's wearing a cowboy hat and spurs. Maybe another one, he's looked like, more like he's got, you know, pink hair, pink striped hair and tattoos all over. Or maybe he's wearing a, you know, a, a biker vest or who knows what. I mean, you know, Jesus comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms. As long as we have Jesus living within us, his Holy Spirit living within us, his life within us, you are Jesus Christ. He is living within you, and you represent him in this world. Okay. So what, what, what I want you to do now is I want, to want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you look hungry. Let's go home and eat lunch. Lord bless you all.